Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro announced that he held a meeting in the capital of the country Caracas with a delegation of the U.S. government. Russia will announce a ceasefire and it's willing to provide humanitarian corridors in Ukraine from March 8th beginning at 10 a.m. according to the head of the Russian Interagency Coordination Office for Humanitarian Aid. And in Libya, authorities suspend oil exports due to a drop in barrels per day earnings caused by the political and economic crisis in Ukraine's conflict with Russia. Hi, this is from the South Amer News anchor Dio Martin from the Telesur Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro announced that he held a meeting in the capital of the country, Caracas, with a delegation of the U.S. government, calling it very diplomatic. We had a meeting. I could describe it as respectful, cordial, very diplomatic between the delegation of the government of the United States and the thinning of the Venezuelan government that I cherish. We did it in the main presidential office, in office number one. There were the flags of the United States and Venezuela and the two United flags look at beautiful as they should be. We had almost two hours talking. Likewise, the head of the Venezuelan state, Nicolas Maduro, affirmed that a work agenda on the welfare of the peoples of the Americas and the Caribbean has been agreed upon with the state delegation. We have agreed to work on a forward agenda issues of interest. I thought it was very important to talk face to face with topics of the utmost interest of Venezuela and the world from respect and from the maximum hope of a better world we can advance in an agenda that allows the peace and peace of the peoples of our hemisphere, of our region, of Latin America and the Caribbean. That's the main thing. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, also in a meeting with the high political and military command, expressed his concern in the framework of the conflicts between Russia and Ukraine. About that, I have to tell you from Venezuela, evaluating the information of strategic intelligence that we handle the world, evaluating the situation of Ukraine with much sincerity and with a desire for peace for the world. We have to state that we are gravely concerned about the possibility of a war in Europe and an extension to other regions of the world of this armed confrontation. Talks between Russia and Ukraine in the Belarusian region of Brest came to an end, the press service of the Russian embassy in Belarus reported. Vladimir Medinsky, advisor to Russian President Vladimir Putin, who heads the delegation of the Russian side, stressed that the expectations of the Russian side in the negotiations with Ukraine were not met. He added that the Ukrainian representatives took away all the documents submitted by Russia to study for the next round of negotiations. Among the issues discussed was the opening of humanitarian corridors, about which the Russian representatives asked directly, Medinsky stressed. Today we discussed for a long time the problems of humanitarian assistance and humanitarian of Korea's agreed at the last meeting, which did not work at all due to the fact that Ukrainian armed forces do not obey the orders of the local command and their national administration. But we hope that from tomorrow these corridors will finally start to work. Besides, there are no agreements on the political discussion and military aspects. I can only say that we have come with a set of documents with draft and proposal for specific treaties, and we hope that today, as for those points, it will be possible to sign at least one protocol. However, the Ukrainian side chose to take all the documents to study them and say we will probably return to this issue and again next meeting. The negotiation this time did not work out, but we hope that the next time we'll be able to make a more significant step in the negotiation. Vladimir Medinsky also expressed his dissatisfaction with the results of the meeting given that the signing of the agreements in which there was apparently a conciliation were not achieved. I can only say that we came here with a large number of written documents. We already had specific agreements, drafts and proposals, and we were hoping that in relation to the options over which we had seemingly already reached agreement in principle, we would be able to sign at least a protocol. 
The United Nations Refugee Agency continues to deploy resources to address the social crisis created by the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, which so far affects millions of people fleeing the aftermath of the war. This Monday, a humanitarian plane arrived in Drozezo, southern eastern Poland, with much needed relief items. The flood carried, among other things, 26,000 blankets. Russia will announce a ceasefire and it's willing to provide humanitarian corridors in Ukraine from March 8th, beginning at 10 a.m., according to the head of the Russian Interagency Coordination Office for Humanitarian Aid. According to the communique, if as of 10 a.m. on March 8th, uh, local time, the Russian Federation announces a ceasefire regime in the Donbass region and is ready to provide humanitarian corridors from Kiev and the population centers adjacent to the Russian Federation through the territory of the Republic of Belarus to Gomel, provided a previous agreement with the Ukrainian part. Russia proposes to Kiev to agree by 3 a.m. Moscow time on March 8th on the humanitarian corridors and the time they will be open according to the headquarters. Oil prices may exceed 300 U.S. dollars per barrel if Russian oil exports are banned, said Alexander Novak, Russian Deputy Prime Minister. The senior official explains that the abandonment of Russian oil will have catastrophic consequences for the world market and the impossibility to quickly replace the volume of Russian oil on the European market that it will take more than a year. The ban on Russian oil will cause an increase in fuel prices, electricity, and heating prices as well in Europe and the United States, he added. Novik noted that Russia has the largest oil supplier to Europe, which consumes about 500 million tons of oil, of which Russia supplies about 150 million tons. Russia also supplies the European Union with another 80 million tons of oil products. Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canel published today a series of comments on his Twitter account where he expresses his opinion on the military conflict in Eastern Europe. The president of Cuba affirms that his country opposes conflict and is in favor of peace in all circumstances, and we are unequivocally opposed to the use of force against any state, quote-unquote. Cuba is absolutely clear about the value and principle of international norms, which serve as protection against unilateralism, imperialism, hegemonism, and attempts to subjugate developing countries. He wrote, regarding the European Union and the U.S. sanctions against Russia, he said, Continuing to use economic trade and financial sanctions as an instrument of pressure against any country does not solve the current crisis, but rather adds fuel to the fire and aggravates the economic situation. And on Monday, the mandatory use of masks will be eliminated in several Brazilian cities. The city of Rio de Janeiro will stop requiring the use of anti-COVID masks in closed spaces as of Tuesday, becoming the first Brazilian state capital to take this step. The measure is possible thanks to the drop in the number of coronavirus infections and deaths recorded throughout the country since mid-February. Their use was already optional outdoors in Rio since October, but some residents continue to use them in public places. In Sao Paulo, the largest city in Brazil, the use of face masks is still mandatory, but this week the authorities could stop requiring them in open spaces. In the capital, Brasilia, they will not be mandatory outdoors as of this Monday. And we're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. In an increasingly turbulent world, uh, ties between China and Latin America and the Caribbean enjoy a vitality that has overcome trade wars, transportation crises, and the worst pandemic in a century, said China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi during a press conference to outline the main lines of China's diplomacy on the occasion of the annual meeting of the parliament. A correspondent brings us the details. China's State Councilor and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Wang Yi, today highlighted the good momentum of Beijing's ties with Latin America and the Caribbean. In his customary press conference on the occasion of the annual meeting of the Chinese parliament, the foreign minister pledged to continue supporting the efforts of developing nations, especially those in Latin America and the Caribbean, to confront the pandemic and avoid a greater economic impact. Since the outbreak of the new coronavirus, China has developed active 
anti-epidemic cooperation with Latin America and provide nearly 400 million doses of vaccines. Last year, the trade volume between China and Latin America and the Caribbean surpassed U.S. 400 billion for the first time. We also successfully held the third ministerial meeting of the China CELAC Forum and reached a broad consensus on deepening strategic mutual trust and practical cooperation between China and CELAC in key areas over the next three years. As a Latin America proverb says, a true friend can touch your heart from the other side of the world. China will continue to work with Latin American and Caribbean friends to deepen friendship and expand cooperation. Chinese Chancellor sent a clear message to those who insist on seeing double intentions and efforts on the part of Beijing to impose its hegemony in the region. Latin America is a land full of hope and vitality. It is not someone's backyard. What the Latin American people need is equity, justice and win-win cooperation, not power politics and bullying. China and Latin America are developing areas and the common aspiration for independence, development, and revitalization closely links the Chinese dream with the Latin American dream. At the conference, Wang Ji also referred to key points in China's foreign policy, such as ties with the United States, Taiwan affairs, and China's unchanged position in favor of dialogue between Russia and Ukraine. On the Ukrainian issue, peace and dialogue must be promoted, and China has already made some efforts in this respect. There have been two rounds of negotiations, and we hope there will be a third. The, the more divergences there are, the greater the need to sit down and negotiate. Rivers do not freeze over on a cold night. The situation in Ukraine has very complex causes, and the first thing is to keep calm and reason and seek a peaceful solution. With the storm clouds on the horizon of military conflicts, economic sanctions with unpredictable consequences and global inflation, the strength of Sino-Latin American ties is one of the pillars in the efforts to put the pandemic chapter behind us and embark on the road to recovery. Iran Ciperaza, Telesur, Beijing, China. And Latin America social movements and civil society marched in different countries to reject gender-based violence on the occasion of the commemoration of International Women's Day. In Chile, women citizens and female citizens gathered in the vicinity of the Palacio de la Moneda to demand their rights in protest against the government of President Sebastián Piñera. They demanded an end to patriarchal violence, which in 2021 left 10,000 pregnancies in girls and adolescents. On the other hand, in El Salvador, women's rights organizations marched to the center of the capital, San Salvador, demanding justice for missing women and for the high number of femicide victims registered in 2021. We are protesting because we do not forget that the government of Sebastián Pineda is criminal. We believe that he has a historical responsibility and he has to pay for the crimes against human rights that he committed for having taken a country to desperation that protested on October 18th and we do not forget. <laughs> On Monday, Congress elections and inter-party consultations to choose presidential candidates in Colombia began for those residing abroad. There are more than 900,000 Colombian registered voters residing outside the country. So far, the Colombian Foreign Ministry has set up 1,251 polling stations in 67 countries. For the Senate, voters will be able to choose between a ballot for either the national or the indigenous districts. And for the House of Representatives, the choice would be between the international, indigenous, or Afro-descendant districts. Elections in Colombia will be held this coming Sunday, March 13th. Let's continue in Colombia with the upcoming parliament elections, uh, where voters will get their say at the inter-party coalition consultations, where contending parties will define their presidential candidate. The National Registry of Civil Status announced in recent days a total of 15 pre-candidates registered by the three coalitions, which are Historical Pact, Hope Center, and Team for Colombia. The candidates chosen by each coalition will be the contenders at the next presidential election, scheduled for next May the 29th. According to data from National Registry, there are more than 38 million citizens registered to vote, and there will be 112,000 polling stations throughout the country. In Venezuela, the Fifth Congress of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela continues to discuss topics of importance for the political organization. 
During the meeting, issues related to ethics and revolutionary values in the face of corruption, indolence, and bureaucratism were addressed for which was ordered zero tolerance. In this sense, the President of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, pointed out that it should not be a theoretical issue. It should serve to own massive values of capitalism, of consumerism. It was oriented to apply a process of revival of revolutionary ethics and morals and leaders and all men and women who upheld the public office. The President also insisted on the need to punish all officials and members of the PSUV who are involved in illicit acts. And on Monday, Bolivian authorities announced that the country will produce its first anti-cancer drugs. According to information issued by the Minister of Health and Sports, Jason Ausa, the first radio pharmaceuticals will be produced as of July. Ausa assured the facilities and operations of the Nuclear Medicine and Radiotherapy Center response to a debt owed to the Bolivian people. At the same time, he detailed that the center already has qualified personnel and facilities with state-of-the-art imaging equipment that enables the early detection of oncological pathologies. And on Monday in Argentina, the Chamber of Deputies debates the agreement established by the national government with the International Monetary Fund on the debt. The meeting is expected to be attended by the Minister of Economy, Martin Guzman, who announced that legislators will receive all the documents that make up the agreement, including the Memorandum of Economic and Financial Policies, plus the Technical Memorandum of Understanding. The Chief of Cabinet, Juan Mansur, as well as authorities from the Central Bank, the Secretary of Finance, Raul Rigo, and the Director of the Southern Cone before the IMF, Sergio Chodos, are also expected to have participated. This is the first time that an agreement with the IMF is dealt with by the Congress, and it sought to refinance the debt of some $45 billion taken by the administration from former President Mauricio. Marketing. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. And welcome back. In Libya, authorities suspended oil exports due to a drop in barrels per day earnings caused by the political and economic crisis in Ukraine's conflict with Russia. The Minister of Oil, Mohamed Oun, detailed in response to a query from financial company Bloomberg that oil production currently stands at about 1.2 million barrels, which represents a statistic below the annual average as a consequence of the sanctions imposed by the United States on the Russian Federation and the constant tensions that have led to a serious economic and political crisis in energy and oil market. Mohammed also announced that the national oil company stopped shipments to the main ports of export due to the west to the west due to the military presence in the Sahara. Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman Said Katiz Badeh said Monday that peaceful nuclear cooperation between China, Iran, and Russia should not be constrained by the sanctions the United States and European Union have imposed on the latter. His comments came after Russia's foreign minister linked the sanctions imposed on Moscow to the ongoing negotiations to revive the 2015 nuclear deal. In recent days, negotiators from all sides in Vienna have signaled that a possible deal was closed. As ahead of the day, United Nations nuclear watchdog agreed to, to a timetable with Iran to reveal answers to longstanding questions about Tehran's nuclear program. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki recently said, quote, unquote, we don't believe that the sanctions that have been imposed on them have anything to do with this common goal, referring to Russia's role in the negotiations. Peaceful nuclear cooperation between Iran, Russia, China, and other countries obviously should not be limited or affected by any sanction. This is what we make of what was said. So far, Russia has shown a constructive approach of reaching a collective agreement in Vienna, and we interpret that they say in this framework. We will wait for them to give us more details in Vienna. In Syria, at least 15 soldiers died and 18 others resulted injured in an attack perpetrated by groups linked to the self-proclaimed Islamic State. The aggression was perpetrated against a military bus with different weapons in the desert of Palmyra in the center of the country. Also, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights warned the death toll could rise due to the magnitude of the incident. At least 61 Syrian Arab Army soldiers have been killed by the terrorist group cells since the beginning of 2022. In Ivory Coast, a building collapsed, left five people dead and around 15 injured in the Abiyan city. 
Reports indicated that the four-story building yielded in early morning hours in Angre District. Building's residents had previously alerted about the existence of some cracks along the construction. In this respect, First Minister of Ivory Coast, Patrick Ashi, said that it will initiate an investigation about the incident, which happened just one week after another similar event where seven people died when a building under construction collapsed in another place of the city. An investigation with the work of 65 journalists from 15 countries by the name of Mining Secrets revealed a Swiss mining company had reports of pollution in an indigenous area in Guatemala's northeast. The report also links the Swiss mineral extraction company Solway Investment Group to bribery and intimidation activities. Accusations of business consortium categorically refuted. However, the query coordinated among several media outlets confirmed Solway used illegal devices to conceal any element that traced a company to the pollution caused by the mining operations they conducted in Guatemala with national authorities as accessories to the cover-up. The investigation shows that the infamous red spot that popped up in the Isabel Lake in 2017 and that many considered a cause of the reproduction of kelp was actually one of the many effects of the contamination caused by the Swiss entity's mining activities. The journalistic enterprise also disclosed a mineral extraction business was involved in espionage cases that targeted journalists and in the manipulation and intimidation of communal leaders and local authorities. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at Toaster English. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Toaster English, I'm Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.